Five years ago, we made a video which we called Five Reasons Not to Buy a Boat, didn't we? It was our most viewed video, I think, to date. Still, yeah, 850,000 views and more and over 2,500 comments. And we're still getting them now, five years down the line. We're still getting views and comments on that video. Yeah, and it rattled a few cages. It did. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But uh, I guess we should ask the question, why are we revisiting this? Yeah, why are we revisiting? Well, five years, I was quite interested to know if we still felt the same. If we still had those reasons, if we discarded some, if they've changed, if we've got new reasons. I also wanted to just to say that ours was the first. <laughs> yes, it's been copied. If you do a search for reasons not to buy a boat, uh, quite a few videos come up, but ours will be at the top and it's the oldest. It was the original. Yeah, we did do it first. Others have copied us, but there you go. Let's got that off our chest. So now we continue. <laughs> so what do you want to say first? Do you want to get, dive straight in or well, what do you first, want to do? The first thing I'd like to say is that we are recording in very trying conditions. Yes. The wind has decided to pick up. It is blowing like hell out there. Yep. Uh, so it excuses if you hear the noise. And we're recording on a Friday rather than a Saturday, which means that the call to prayer is happening. We've already had to wait for over an hour I think, <laughs> because it was so loud. Uh, so he's just murmuring now. So apologies if you uh, have these distractions in the background. But of course, that is all about living on a boat in the tropics in Southeast Asia. Yeah, and we're in Indonesia, which um, is predominantly Muslim and we're just off the coast of uh, Sumbawa on a little island there so yeah it is going on here and it does appear to be quite a big thing here. Mm. Well I mean this could be a reason not to buy a boat couldn't it and in <laughs> fact we've had that comment quite a few times. Yeah. Uh, a number of people have commented on how they couldn't they can't deal with the uh, call to prayer. Yes. For example, cultural differences. There we go. That's one of the many reasons not to buy a boat and not to travel around. OK, so before we continue, though, got to say that that was perhaps the wrong title for that video, because we're not saying reasons for not buying a boat. We're saying five reasons for not buying a boat to live on. And there is a difference. Yes, and I think also really the reason why we did the original video was because we were conscious of the fact that there were so many YouTubers, uh, sailing YouTubers out there that appeared to be painting the perfect pleasure. I'm trying to think of alliteration with lots of P's. Uh, the perfect sort of cruising lifestyle where, you know, it's all about drinking and parties and beaches and bikinis and... I don't know. I, we just got a sense that perhaps if you believe that this is what life afloat is all about, then uh, you're in for a, a bit of a shock. Yeah, I think that this is still a problem. There are so many more YouTube channels than when we first started. There were just a handful of us, but now they've mushroomed and there are so many of them, all, many of them, not all, but many of them painting this perfection, picture of perfection and mm. ease. Uh, if you consider that people are uploading perhaps once a week for between 10 and 30 minutes, that's all you're getting, one tiny edited insight, tiny weeny bit of our lives on board. And these five reasons are often overlooked and unmentioned. I find that a lot of videos that put out by YouTube channels are, as you say, parting on beaches, but they neglect the real hard stuff. Oh yeah, they do do maintenance videos and that's all fun and great, great news, isn't it? It's not really like that though. Hello, I'm Liz. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to Follow the Boat in which we discuss what it's really like to give it all up to live on a boat. And go traveling around the world. We've been doing it since 2006 and we're still at it. Each week we talk about our latest YouTube videos. And about boats, sailing, travel or anything else which floats into our heads. And if you leave a comment we like, we'll give you an answer and a name check. Peace, Peace and, and fair, fair winds. winds. One of the criticisms we got, and believe me, we got many. Oh, yeah. and we're, we're going to talk a, a little bit about some of the comments we got and address some of those comments five years on. Um, but of course, one of the things many people said was, oh, you're being so negative, bloody Brits, whinging poms. Uh, and look, if you know us, you, you know that um, we like to be honest. 
And we, we do. And we, but we don't make a drama out of these things either. But we just basically tell it like it is. And I think it just upset some people that we kind of destroyed their dreams because they had this idea that yeah. it was all about beaches and bikinis and barbecues. Um, you know, we're just being real. That's all. Yeah. But just going back to your point, you did say that uh, we should have established the difference between living aboard a boat mm. uh, because quite a few comments we got were from weekend sailors or people who own boats uh, who don't necessarily live on them and there is quite a difference there very much so i'll start with this one comment uh, which highlights a few issues um, it's fcb fraser coast boys um, he says you're a pair of idiots <laughs> uh, that's your it's spelt uh, y-o-u-r um, if you're going to be insulting them, please do it grammatically correctly. <laughs> <laughs> you're a pair of idiots. I have a 52 foot yacht and a 38 foot yacht and they only cost $186 per year. Registration, $650 each per year for slipping and descaling and thirty uh, sorry $300 for anti-fail. Bloody hell, well, you're getting a bargain, mate. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that kind of comment is typical of quite a few of the comments. What I, you know, this goes back to these hero sailors. Uh, you know, they're, they've got everything. They've got everything sorted. There are no problems on their boat. Well, he hasn't included insuring it for a start. Anyway. Well, I just, you know, I, but I think the, the, the username gives it away. They're called Fraser Coast Boys. And I'm guessing this person is a coastal cruiser who uses their, their boats, plural, right. you know, just at the weekends and doesn't live on it. He goes on, you shouldn't have got a boat. You obviously got one with problems. Get a different hobby. And I think it was that line that sort of spells the difference between uh, some cruisers who buy boats to live on versus, you know, a, ho a hobby, a weekend hobby. Yeah, so in a way, it's our fault. We should have made that clear. We should have said in the title that we're talking about livable boats. We're talking about not buying a livable boat. There is one other thing that we need to make clear, and I'm, you're probably going to do this as we go through, is that we are living on a boat. We obviously love living on a boat. We've lived on it for 17 years. This particular video was slightly tongue in cheek. Most of you got it. It was the people who took it literally that really thought we were being serious about do not buy a boat. Yeah, I think there's something to be said for satire and irony. And, uh, you know, being Brits, of course, we're quite good at that, but it does go over quite a few people's heads. Fortunately, most people got it. And in fact, uh, Dan Stevens pretty much sums things up. He says, thanks for the honest assessment of being a sailboat owner. It's easy to believe otherwise when you watch some of the YouTube channels with young couples sailing around the world and seemingly always having a great time. And yeah, that is pretty much why we did the video. It is indeed. So we're just being honest, but clearly it's a life that we enjoy. So I think we should start with, uh, with the five reasons that we gave then and just talk them through and if, see if you've got any comments or anything you want to say. So the first one we said was they go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> do they go wrong? They do go wrong and they need constant upkeep, maintenance and repair. For me, that's the number one reason why I would suggest to most people to think twice about before you buy a boat to live on because it's not like a home a lot of people in the comments say oh it's just like having a house you've got to do this you've got to do that it's far worse your house isn't being attacked by the marine environment day in and day out and your house won't sink if you don't look after it properly <laughs> yeah but according to fraser coast boys oh, who yeah. i read out earlier they said uh, you obviously got a boat with problems <laughs> what do you say to that I've never met a boat that doesn't have a problem. Um, even some of the f most fantastic super crew boats that we've come across and met over the years, they are continually battling problems. The most beautiful boats, whether they be sailboats or motorboats, they have problems. Engineers are paid the most amount of money, aren't they, on super yacht crews because they spend all their time firefighting and dealing with, dealing with problems. Yeah, and I think if you were, as, as a guest, to walk onto one of those boats, you wouldn't see any problems because that's the crew's job is to make sure you don't see those problems. But if you think that a boat does not have problems, I'm sorry, but you are you're misinformed you you've maybe you've got a little surprise coming up you know in the next six months or so but yeah, yeah if you believe that seriously come on maybe we need to rephrase it uh not not problems but talk about the fact that it's an ongoing work ongoing. project yes ongoing 
Reason43 Paul, who's a, a commenter on YouTube, says, I have a friend who bought a second-hand 45-foot boat in immaculate condition. It was near new. He's sailing from Greece to Australia very slowly. Um, it's been four years now, and every email or journey update, bar none, includes stuff that has gone wrong, endless expenses. He loves what he is doing, but he has the income to do it. Budget sailing, forget it. These kind of people are giving out priceless information, referring to us. Right, okay, yes. Yeah, it's, um, don't underestimate it. You will literally be doing something every day. You need to go, so what we said in the first video, uh, do have a look at it if you have time after this. We said you need to be an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter. You need to understand and know how to service diesel engines so much more. So none of this is probably something you know about unless you're one of those lucky people who's born with a spanner in their hands and loves all that kind of thing. If you love tinkering, boat life is the absolute perfect yeah. way of living for you. Yes, yes. There's, a, there's another couple of comments under that, actually. Go on. Um, talking about the environment. I mean, this mm. is you talked about the difference between owning a home and owning a boat, which was something that we mentioned in the original video. Um, and you can draw comparisons between the two but as you say the marine environment can be quite harsh and uh, st the username is st uh, moisture is the number one cause for failures wet electrics wet engine rooms etc are the main cause the big issue with pleasure boats is there are many places where the outside environment gets into so many areas god do we know that well at the moment we are having problems with our autopilot and we suspect it's because of the one or two electronics related to the autopilot, which are in the lazarette, uh, gets damp. Yeah. And um, we have to be quite vigilant about keeping that, that dry. There's just one of yeah. many examples in which, you know, you've just got to stay on top of that. Yeah, and the other thing I was going to say along those, those lines is don't imagine for a second that having a boat doesn't mean you, <laughs> a boat that's perfect doesn't mean you're going to get damp because you are going to get damp. Things leak. You know, you can get everything perfect. You can come out and go back into the water having just spent a year on making the boat perfect. But it doesn't stay like that. Mm. But that's the thing. Maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. It doesn't stay like that. And things gradually start to leak. Wear away, stop working. I mean, electronics and electrics is, is the perfect one. But you actually get physical leaks in your boat. Talk to any sailor. It doesn't have to be a liverboard. Anyone who's got a boat, they'll tell you that leaks will appear from anywhere and you don't know why. And it's a pain in the ass trying to work out where they come from. Going back to the comparison between houses, uh, I'd be interested in your uh, response to this by P. Pumpkin. Right. As an alternative to owning a home, the maintenance cost and effort of a 40-foot sailboat is less. When I had an apartment, owning a 40-foot boat was a joy and a great escape. As it should be, I should hope. Yes. Now that I own a home, I have electrical work, house painting, weeding, seeding, mowing, pruning, cleaning, servicing, heating systems, air conditioning systems, shoveling snow, cutting up trees that storms have knocked over, fixing leaky roofs, repairing windows and screens, insects, water wells, blah, 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 blah. And so he goes on with a great big list. And he says, as far as I'm concerned, maintaining my sailboat was much easier to maintain than my small cape on an acre of land and also much cheaper he says that he pays $11,000 a year alone in property taxes, and that's cheap for his area. Right, OK. So I don't know about property taxes. It's not something we do in the UK. You pay when you buy the place, but once you've got it... Oh, you pay... Yeah, council you, tax. UK council tax and so yeah. forth. Um, I don't really see the value in comparing the two. However, what I would say is we have both, and the boat's far more expensive than the flat. What can I say? It's more expensive. We have a flat in London, an apartment, three bedroom apartment, which we rent out. We've had, we've done that right from the beginning. And um, it's been reasonably easy to rent. And we touch wood have had great people all the way through. So from that point of view, it's not been a problem. Not really been a problem. Occasionally we have to redecorate bits and we have to change things. We pay council tax and they pay for gas, electricity and that stuff. But on the whole, there isn't very much we have to do to the flat. What do you think? I don't know, off the top well, but, of my head. Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult one, though, because we don't live in it. So, no. first of all, we're not aware of everything. I mean, I'm sure if we went back into the flat now, we, we would see a whole load of things that need doing that perhaps the tenants don't see mm. or don't tell us about. Uh, 
because we don't live there, we're not constantly wearing things down and fully aware of things that are breaking all mm. the time. Mm. Um, but I, for me, really, it's I think there's some things on the boat that you must stay on top of because mm. if you don't, it becomes a danger. And there are some things on a house, of course, where that is also true. For example, perhaps yeah. uh, you've got loose slates on your roof, which are a hazard and le leaking water. So there are some comparisons. Um, I think one of the other problems, though, is that uh, on the whole, um, certainly for us in Asia, when we try to do repairs ourselves, uh, things can be costly because you're having to import things. And, um, you know, it takes a long time to, to learn how to change something that perhaps you haven't done before. Um, but, yeah, it, it's yeah, it's it's there's a fine line there between comparing Swings and roundabouts. I mean, I've, I've owned property for years and I have to say I haven't had the headaches with property that I've had with the boat. As far as Southeast Asia goes, you can get a plumber quite easily here in a building. You can get all the people that you want here much easier than you can in the UK. How long does it take if you've got a leak to get somebody out if it's not an emergency? In the UK? Yeah, it took us months to find a builder and most of them didn't even bother to reply to my, <laughs> to my emails when yeah. we first bought the flat. So, I mean, the, the Southeast Asia is really good for getting things done because people are very hands-on here. Um, yeah, so, anyway, so, boats go wrong. Sammy D said, if you go and buy a bargain basement piece of shit, <laughs> what do you expect in regards to fixing things? If you have a diesel engine running properly, it just won't die. I use my diesel van for tens of thousands of kilometres, no problem. Uh, so, all well, I would Good say for you, well done. All I'd say to that is, is how many oceans have you crossed with yes. your with your diesel engine in your van? It's not in the marine environment. Very, very different. I think this is what people don't get that who don't have boats, that the, the sea kills everything. It's really, it's very nasty. Just, it gets just, into everything. Just, you know, you take a diesel engine on a boat, you know, just the fact it's water cooled by sea, sea water. OK, it's got a freshwater reservoir, but that in its in turn is cooled by salt water. Just that off the top of my head alone can create problems. You don't have those kind of problems with a diesel engine in a van. Any kind of sea ingress into that mm -hmm. engine compartment is difficult. We had ours for 25 years. She did pretty well that. Uh, for, we know other boats that have had theirs for longer. We know others that have had them for a shorter length of time. It depends on the situation of your boat. And yeah, maybe you're a crap sailor and you're letting water in. Yeah, maybe. Maybe you're a crap driver on, in your van. I don't know. I don't know. I don't like this thing about always having to compare things are better than this and things this is better than that it just gets on my nerves i don't know what this compulsion is that we have as human beings to say yes well i do it this way it's better than your way you know i live in a house it's better than it's better than a it's e but, more difficult or it's easier i don't know but, but to, to be fair is, to, yes but in the original video we yeah. made the comparison with bricks and mortar Did versus we? a boat yes mm. so so uh, you know for people to counter that is justified i think right Don Drone says, obviously boating is not for you. If you buy a newer boat, you wouldn't have a piece of junk that you have to work on on a regular basis. Boating is not for everyone. And uh, we've said it many times before. We know people that buy new boats who have continual problems. Buying a new boat is not a guarantee of avoiding problems. I would say, perhaps, on the whole, yes, maybe your first couple of years out at sea, you know, if all things are ticking over, you, you're probably doing well to not have to do anything. But, you know, it, let's think of, let's say, an, an impeller on an engine. Yeah, if you're um, not changing it. You know, you might have a new engine, but if you don't change that impeller every year or check it every six months, um, it doesn't matter whether it's a new boat or, or not. You've yeah. still got those same problems. Well, that goes back to what I was saying, is that you have to continually maintain a boat scrupulously to stop those problems happening. Some pr problems will happen anyway, but the maintenance is absolutely massive. So you must learn all of those skills, preferably before you get your boat or when you get it, go through the, all the systems, work out. If you don't know how an engine works, you've got to learn it. You can be out in the middle of the ocean with no wind. You might need your engine. You might need to do something. Engine doesn't work. Supposing the sails rip, supposing there's a problem with the rigging, supposing um, you've got a leak, you're you can't get hold of your fresh water for some reason because of a plumbing issue. The pumps are not working. There are so many things that can go wrong. And you, and you alone, because you're in the boat out in the ocean, have got to sort it out. So don't be blinkered to the fact that it's all one great big party. 
it is for a lot of the time, but things go definitely go wrong. They went wrong fairly early on for us and we just each time something goes wrong we we learn not to do it again or to learn what the problem was and how to sort it out. I know of brand new boats that have been so poor that they've given up sailing. Um, we had one recently in Saba. They spent a year trying to sort out with the manufacturers what the problems were and they still weren't sorted out last time we saw them. Sorry for interrupting, but while I've got you here, if you like what we do and you want to support us and become a Patreon or join us on FTB Mates or even drop a quid in the rum fund, go to followtheboat.com forward slash pub. Of course, come to the pub. The next point is relationships. Boats can kill relationships. Well, living in a confined space, to be honest, can kill relationships. And we did do a whole podcast on this. It was episode 024, how to avoid fights on a sailboat, basically. We talked that through, didn't we, dear? Yeah. Yes, we did. Without, without argument, I hasten to <laughs> add. Uh, fudge get about it, as in forget about it, uh, says you guys look like a lovely couple. The arguments must be savage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Maverick Max says... I've seen many things tear relationships apart, jobs particularly. When people choose to marry, then they need to forget everything else and do whatever they can to be with each other. I know being apart certainly drives a wedge between couples, so it is amazing to hear too much time together takes its toll on relationships. And I think that was really the point we're trying to make, that um, it is nice to be apart sometimes, but when you live in a confined space and you are with each other 24 hours a day because it's not like one of you is going off to work. Uh, you can be a tanker, okay, maybe you go ashore and you do different things, but on the whole, you are with each other all the time. And Maverick Mac was obviously surprised to hear that that can take its toll as much as being apart from each other. Yeah, it certainly can. We've seen couples that have split after trying the liveaboard life. Mm. They've actually gone their separate ways. Quite a few solo sailors around the world now who didn't start that way. Um, it's it's very difficult. Confined space being the main thing. But also you're on a boat and you can't just get off. You know, you can't just storm off. Mm. You're here. You've got to work it through. There's loads of stuff that we talk through in the in the podcast on this specific subject, which you probably don't really need to do now. We just want to raise your awareness to the fact that living 24-7 on a boat is a very special and unusual situation. So be prepared to do that. And if you haven't done that before, if you've both been at work, or you've both been spending a lot of time away from each other and coming together for the good times and the evenings and the weekends, very different on a boat. Mm. Uh, talking of relationships, Jay Cordick left a very nice comment. Uh, what a couple of whining old farts. <laughs> well, we're, we're definitely old. Did you pick out any nice comments, by the way? Um, what a lovely couple, oh, okay. says Grandma 2013. Apart from all the sound advice, I'm so impressed by the double act. How you cover the points together alternately and so fluently and harmoniously. <laughs> that is our relationship in a nutshell, Grandma. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, yes. Well, we've been doing this for a while now, so I suppose we are a bit of a double act. So I think we'll leave relationships unless there's anything else you want to say on that one. Well, I just wanted to leave with uh, David Hancock, bless him, said, I wish I had two boats rather than two divorces. Oh, Yes, okay. that's hard. So, yes, yeah, so just be prepared. But Scott Simmons did say much of the same applies to being a homeowner too. Couples soon get sick of one another when living in a mansion or a trailer. And I think that's um, that's a fair point. If you are spending all your time together, sometimes it doesn't matter whether you are living in a vast, huge house or in a tiny space. Perhaps there's just something wrong with the relationship that, uh, you know, no environment is going to cover up. Yes, and certainly if you think that coming away to get away from it or living on a boat is going to help, it won't. It will magnify what's already a problem, I think. Yeah. So just be aware of that before you embark on this lifestyle. Number three. Okay. Uh, this one was called cleaning, clean boat, whatever. Oh, so this one has nothing to do with me then? <laughs> no, no, nothing. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> That's the problem. Anyway, if cleanliness is next to godliness, is your motto... Living on a boat is not for you. And I mean that wholeheartedly. Can you explain? Because living on a boat, you... I mean, this is in the tropics, so we have the windows and the hatches, everything open all of the time to get the air through. We don't have AC. Um, so it's, it's all open. So it's like living in a house where there's a lot of... a bit of a windy day and everything is 
coming in through your windows, you've got the front door and the back door open and all your windows and all the rubbish that's outside is blustering around, whether it's leaves or whether it's actual rubbish, is all pouring into your house. And this happens on the boat every day, all day, whenever, we've got, whenever, whenever we're anchor, also when we're sailing. So there's an awful lot of stuff coming in all the time. So if you're handy with a hoover and you love doing a bit of polishing, you'll be in heaven because it, it's never ending. Yes, I mean, you mentioned rubbish, but really, yeah. I think the bigger concern were critters. Yeah. Uh, and in particular, I think we talked about in that particular episode, uh, cockroaches and rats. And a couple of people, Steve, Cockney Rebel, said, how do rats and cockroaches get on a boat at sea? Lol. And Warren Fegans uh, says, rats and cockroaches on a boat, how? It's easy. Rats swim. It just so happens, literally two hours before starting the recording of this podcast, we have discovered rat droppings on the boat that yeah. weren't there yesterday. The only thing I can think is that we were ashore for the whole day yesterday. Our dinghy we pulled up by a whole load of restaurants. My guess is one of two things. Either a rat climbed into that dinghy last night and we brought it back with us. Or, as you say, and this does happen, rats do swim they have been known to climb up the anchor chain and on board. And in fact, we know this happened to someone very yeah. recently. We had to loan them our rat trap yeah. because exactly that had happened. Now, bear in mind, we haven't been dockside since we dropped in the water six months ago. Mm -hmm. So there's no there's nowhere we could have picked up a rat except from the water swimming or via the dinghy. So dockside is normally where you get them. And most docks and harbours and ports and marinas and um, places like that have rats. They really do. They mm. certainly do in Southeast Asia, but they, they had them in, in Europe. They have them, I'm sure, in America and, and elsewhere. So there are rats everywhere. Uh, and if you're tied alongside it, you've got a very good chance of getting one. Yeah, we know yeah, most fishing. people have had them. Um, it's nothing to do with how clean your boat is. It's just that they like to get on and have a good old rummage and they stay on your boat. But we didn't have rats for years because we had a cat on board. Mm. Um, it's the only way to be absolutely 100% sure that you won't get rats. Millie was a really good little ratter, nothing lived on board, so she killed anything that came near us. The moment we lost Millie, we started to get rats. That's very true, yeah. it's very true. As for cockroaches, well of yeah. course, did you know cockroaches fly? Mm. I've lost count of the amount of times I've been sitting in this cockpit and something has flown in and hit me in the face. It's a cockroach. Mm. You know, it's not because they are attracted to a dirty boat or food. They they do travel. And unfortunately, you only need one of them, a pregnant cockroach, uh, to lay her eggs and, and that's it. So uh, fortunately, touch wood, we've been all right with cockroaches because you are really good at staying on the case am, with cockroaches. Yes, I'm pretty vigilant and you can usually, you know, I have lots of powder around everywhere all the time. I'm constantly changing it. But they do, again, they'll come on when you're tied to shore. Uh, they just get on the boat. And if you're anywhere near a fishing boat, they're usually full of cockroaches. Yeah. Um, commercial boats, you know, they have them and uh, very easy to get on. So, yes, you just have to be vigilant. Same with ants. Ants will get on. Same with mosquitoes and midges and noceums. But then that's not mm. just boats, that's anywhere outside. Yeah. Uh, Ricardo Rijo said, all them insects you find are caused by lazy boat keeping. Tear all the labels, all paper, all packaging. Uh, this is something that we heard about before we started. Cockroaches like to nest in cardboard. And yes, it's true, they do like doing that. But believe me, taking off all the labels does not negate the possibility of getting a cockroach infestation. Yeah. I think it's a fallacy. Yeah, I mean, don't bring cardboard boxes on board. Um, you know, when you go to the supermarket, don't pack everything in a cardboard box and bring that back. We never bring cardboard on board. That one I can understand. Yeah. But you, the actual fruit and veg will contain cockroaches. If you buy um, pineapple, so many times I've found cockroaches in the top of the pineapple. This is here in... in That's where you always break off the top of the uh, pineapple. I break you? it off, yes. Bunches it's, of bananas, they're yeah. a classic. You yeah. get all sorts in bunches of bananas. Yeah. You've got I mean, to stay yeah. on top of that. Yes, I do clean everything when we get it. So, um, touch wood, at the moment we've been fine for months, but, you know, they're there. Uh, Lady Mia Mia said, uh, of just living on a boat generally, it's as close to trailer living disgusting. <laughs> I actually, back then, I did say to them, what, 
What do you mean disgusting? Do, do you say the same thing when you see a great big super yacht turn up in Monaco? Do you say that's also disgusting? Because it's the same thing. It's people living on a floating vessel at sea. Um, but yeah, when it comes to cleaning, same rules apply as if you were living in a house, really. Yes, you do, you do what you can, do as much as you can. Some of us um, are more concerned about dust than others. Doesn't really matter, whatever, whatever suits you. But do be prepared to have a lot more cleaning to do than you do in the house, I would say, from my experience. Do you like our coffee mugs? You can get your own from our shop. Find them at followtheboat.com forward slash shop. Okay, number four, uh, this is going to be a quick one, I think, but, but we did talk about wardrobe and the, the thrust of this was how your wardrobe is going to change when you live on board. Mm -hmm. And that is simply because you just don't have the room to carry your 20 pairs of shoes <laughs> and your, your 10 suits or whatever it is that you like to wear when you're on land. You just don't have the space for it. On top of that, two other things, certainly in the tropics, your wardrobe will change um both for in terms of shorts and t-shirt in the hot weather perhaps also though your sailing gear as well you need to put aside room for your sailing gear um so it, it will change in that respect and of course laundry getting your laundry done it's not like we've got a washing machine on board or we don't no so. not, a lot of boats do have washing machines the they problem because with, with how you look it was also about um washing and that brings in the whole issue of water Mm. You know, so um, we have a water maker, and it's great and it does really well and we can pretty much have a shower most of the time whenever we want one. But um, we don't always have a shower every day because sometimes we're in the sea, shower poo, off. Poo, poo. No, but it can be a problem if your water maker's not working or you've been at anchor for a while, you don't have enough power to run the water maker. Then you've got to start just being a little bit more careful with the water. So this impacts laundry. So I very rarely wash the sheets at anchor. I'll take them ashore and do them in a laundrette here. A lot of people nowadays are putting washing machines on their boats. They're becoming more. A lot. They're becoming more efficient. Mm. And of course, you can buy the little the Daewoo wall-mounted ones mm. that hold about three kilos worth, which isn't much, but it's better than nothing. And again, they're pretty efficient. They only use about twenty liters of water or so. Yes. Yeah. It's not. It's not really the the washing that's the difficult thing. It's the it's the rinsing it all out afterwards. Yeah. That's what takes up the water. So just be aware that. Um, use of water will Im impact your own the, the cleaning of you the boat your laundry and all of that um, and as you say you've got to rethink all your clothes yeah much smaller area yeah it is a good excuse though for wearing nice bright you know <laughs> shirts like this though nice and cool for those listening he has got a tropical shirt which i think we bought that over here didn't we i think in so. malaysia yes, yes. Hotties 3V3N on YouTube says, yeah, I'll pass. I love makeup. I love dresses. Hate roaches. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did mention previously in the first, in the original, that uh, women forget makeup. I and mean, we really don't have time or the need for makeup on a boat. You've got to re reassess your priorities. Uh, and similarly with, with hair, spending hours washing, conditioning and, I don't know, straightening your hair, it's just not going to be a possibility on a boat well and funny enough of course since we recorded that uh, episode five years ago your hair has got a lot shorter i just cut it eventually because i found that even when i tied it back strands would flip round when we were sailing go in my eyes up my nose in my mouth any stray strand it was just a bloody nightmare so of, of constantly trying to find a way to cover it and keep it back sailing so just cutting it has stopped all of that oh, well x x y z aero his name is um, I think he'll like you because he says I like it if women show their natural beauty <laughs> no makeup and no fancy cloth mm. if a woman wakes up next to you in the morning and she looks like what you ever dreamed of you found the right woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah go natural I really believe that's the only way that you're going to survive on a boat don't worry about getting a bit older and getting a bit lined cover yourself up with um, sun cream wear a hat um, one last thing, which I didn't mention the first time round, with the water issue, which came under this, is uh, for menstruating women, you're going to have the problem of getting rid of tampons and sanitary pads, which are not the nicest thing to have lurking around the boat. So there are menstruating caps you can get, which you can wash out. 
If you find this topic interesting and would like to continue the conversation, come and join the Follow the Boat Discord community. Look for the link in the description. It's free. The last section that we talked about was Boat Eat Mummy. I think this is uh, perhaps a statement that's pretty bloody obvious. Even to those that don't own boats, you've got to know that they do eat into your money. Of course, perhaps the single most popular comment under this video mm. was boat stands for break out another thousand. Cutthroat420 says, you didn't know the boat acronym? Bust out another thousand? Uh, yes, we did know that actually, because pretty much every other person <laughs> <laughs> that. It's interesting how no one reads the comments because they'll have seen that that's, that's been yeah, said about a hundred times. A boat is like standing in a shower, ripping up £20 notes, throwing it into a hole. We've, we got all those comments, of course. Yeah. And, and to be honest, they are true. Yeah, they are true to a certain extent. There is a, a constant demand from your boat for money. Um, it might be really big things, like we had to replace the engine once. And that is thousands and thousands of pounds. That's a huge thing. If you've got to re-rig your boat, which some insurance companies demand that you do every two years, re-rigging a boat can be expensive. The actual rigging it's, isn't too bad, but it's all the attachments, isn't it, that can, that can really mount up. That mm. can be thousands of pounds. New sails. You will need new sails. Sails blow out. So far, though, you have mentioned things that are not one-off purchases, but don't yeah. happen that frequently. No. And someone did point that out. I don't have their comment here. They said you forgot to say that a new engine and a new sail, new sails is not something that you buy every year. I did say that, actually. I say that there are one-off big purchases okay. that can happen at any time. Because a lot of people say, what's your monthly budget? And that's what I always say. You don't have a monthly budget. We don't have a monthly budget. We have a mo monthly income that we try to stick to. Yes, that question gets asked all the time. Mm. How much does it cost per year? There are even videos out there where people have tried to break down how much it costs. And it's very subjective. There are so many factors involved in, in, in that, you know, how often you want to eat out, how often you buy clothes, how often you travel, how much diesel perhaps you're buying. Um, lots of factors there and it is very difficult to, to differentiate. Yeah, where you are in the world, a lot cheaper here than being in the Med, for instance. I want to add a sixth point to this. Oh yeah. We didn't particularly talk about this, but power is probably the number one thing that we talk about around the table at night. How you get power onto your boat and the lack of it. Hmm. So everybody's going solar. We've got lithium batteries. It's all changed since we did this last time. We've got more solar, we've got lithium. Um, so all of this is to generate more power so that we can do more things. For instance, you can't have a, uh, you can't do the laundry unless you've got decent enough power to run the washing machine. So just be mindful that power on a boat is difficult to obtain and boats are can be power hungry depending on how you live your life. Mm. You don't agree? I don't really agree. I oh. think power, uh, the access to power on boats is becoming easier and easier mm. to, to access because of things like solar panels are becoming much more efficient. You know, can, our first solar panels we bought 17 years ago are now not half as efficient as the ones you know 17 percent efficiency versus 20 plus efficiency uh, lithium batteries are becoming easier to obtain to install they're becoming cheaper uh, i think on the whole compared to 20 years ago the access we have to power is is just a lot easier mm. but i do take your point that we demand more from our boats and of course you can kiss, keep it simple, stupid, if you really wanted to. You don't have to run laptops or charge your phones on a boat. You don't have to have an integrated chart plotter system. Uh, but, you know, most liverboards do require at least some of these. So our demands for power has definitely increased. But I think what's increased exponentially is the ease of access to power. OK, so ease of access. But we have two laptop, or I have a laptop and you've got a des desktop and they're really hungry. And sometimes we can't run them both. That's true. Yes, we have to be careful. Of course, we do have an induction uh, desktop, desktop, <laughs> uh, countertop uh, for cooking. And that consumes a lot of power. Of course, the great thing is it's free power. It's the solar power. But again, yes, you're right. We do have to be careful and we have to balance and sometimes we can't cook on a cloudy day for example or we have to get the generator out to top up the batteries. Yep so new boat owners I think need to be aware of this that power consumption is something you really do have to consider yep. uh, when you're buying a boat how you're going to power all those things that you want to power. 
Oh, well, okay. So that's a justified sixth uh, point, I suppose. <laughs> I, I think what we should do at the end of this little podcast is end on some nice positives from some of the people who commented. Yeah, because there were more positives, weren't there? There were. There were loads more positives yeah. and negatives. But I do just want to read out just a few of the uh, comments we received. I, I literally just uh, picked out just a few. There were quite a lot of negative comments. And it would generally came from people, I think, who had um, felt like we'd spoiled their dreams. I mean, Cos66 says, thanks, my dream's over. <laughs> And I have to say, really, if a 10 minute video has ruined your dreams, then perhaps you weren't cut out for this lifestyle in the first place. Yes, it's probably built on sand with no knowledge of what we are doing here. Basically, these are reasons not to buy a boat if you're a work shy, incompetent yuppie. <laughs> work shy. You just sound like a lazy kid who won't tidy his room. I cannot for the life of me imagine what you're doing on that boat that's causing the plumbing and electrics to fail all the time. Not sure we said they fail all the time. Uh, your problems are the sighing and whinging instead of thinking properly. And I've been kind here because that was full of grammatical errors. And I think that's what they were trying to say. <laughs> uh, but I do have to read this one comment mm. from a certain Sean Walker. Right. And he said, and again, I'm going to uh, correct all of his spellings and grammatical errors. Is that I get the impression that these people are angrily punching yeah. away at their keyboard when they've had one too many beers. They're definitely not our regular viewers <laughs> who are far more erudite. <laughs> he says, you know, all those reasons are whiny, bitchy things that, what are they, city people or lazy? I got six boats, all an absolute joy to repair. I'm thinking they don't deserve a boat. I mean, I'll be honest, I did look this guy up. He's an expat living in Thailand and he sells long tails. Oh, right. So I think his six boats are long tails. Right. I wonder what the locals think of that. Mm. But this is what really got to me. He says, I can't wait for something to go wrong at sea. And I thought... What do you mean by that? He can't, he can't wait for something to go wrong on our boat to teach us a lesson. Well, things have gone wrong several times at sea. Of course, <laughs> of course they have. As we say. But I just thought... If you are a true yachtsman, a true boat owner, you do not wish that kind of thing on, on your worst enemy. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've met some horrible people that own boats, but there is no way I would ever wish for them to have an issue out at sea. And I just thought that was a shitty comment. Actually, I did think, you know, there is one great English word that we've invented for that kind of attitude, and that's wanker. Yes. That's an absolute wanker at work there. Yes. I think it's really important to go back to the beginning where we said a certain amount of this is tongue in cheek clearly we love boat life we've been doing it for 17 years we know about problems we know how to resolve them and it is something we've been through many many times because we know that we've got to do it it's part of the fabric of being a boat owner and the whole point of that original video and of this podcast is to just say to people Think twice, think about what it's going to be like when you do it. There are problems. It's not a perfect unicorn rainbow world. We're just being realistic. Yeah. And I, I think perhaps some people maybe didn't watch it to the end because mm. at the end of the video, we say, despite all this, here we are sitting on the boat recording this episode, clearly very happy living on the boat. And five years on from that, the same still applies. Mm. Uh, but a few people did say, well, I don't understand. You, you're recording this from a boat. It's like we're not saying don't buy a boat. We're not saying we don't like being on a boat. As Liz says, we're just, we're just being a little bit honest and uh, painting the whole picture, I suppose, is what we're trying to do. Yeah, and just trying to let newbie and would-be cruisers and liverboards in on some of the darker side of this life rather than continuously, joyfully talking about how wonderful and perfect it is. It's great, but there are downsides like there are in every walk of life. Yeah. Stupid video, just discouraging people not to own a boat. I mean, I could go on. There were so many comments like that, but, you know, we, we laugh, we're thick skinned and uh, we actually find these kind of comments amusing. People didn't quite get it. But as I said, I think we should end on some positives. Yes, do. Have you got any? Yes, I, there were, so, as you say, there were so many and I've literally just plucked out of 2,000 comments. I've just plucked a few. <laughs> uh, 
But Keith Turner says that he had a sailboat for six years and sailed around the world. Very honest what you say about the five reasons not to buy a boat. My wife and I saw places and did things that were fabulous and have made friendships with sailor people that have endured. And I think that's the key thing there is that despite all these problems, it's providing you with this opportunity to do these amazing things, visit these incredible places and meet these wonderful people. Mm. And that's really what it's all about. It is. Uh, w. Tay Moss says, agree with all of that, for the five points that we raised, you really need to be okay with the downsides to move forward with this fantasy. That said, if it really is what you're suited for, nothing beats the floating life. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Claude Auger says, owning a boat was extremely expensive, but so worth the memories. I have no regrets of owning three boats in my life, but on to other things now, cheaper things. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I love Cervic, who says, buying a boat was my worst financial decision of my life. I now own four of them. (laughs) (laughs) It's addictive. Be careful. Yes. And do you remember Sean Toomey? Sean yes. used to comment, so I'm sure we haven't heard from you for ages, but if you're out there, please do leave us a comment. We love reading Sean's comments. And he said a friend told him how he was with pen and paper at the table trying to show a caravaner travelling around Australia how it didn't make financial sense with columns for fuel, maintenance, repairs, depreciation, park fees, loss of income, etc., etc. Satisfied with his logic and costing proof, He was met with the response, you forgot the value of the fun column. (laughs) The fun column. The fun column. Don't forget the fun column. It's so true, isn't it? (laughs) All right, I think that's it, don't you? I think we've uh, done it to death. So we hope you enjoyed our remix and our rethink of the first video. Um, And I don't think much has changed since we first... I don't Did think, that? I don't, it? I don't think anything has changed. But yeah. hopefully, you know, because this podcast has a slightly different audience, maybe we'll be able to reach just a few more people out there that are thinking about this lifestyle. And really, ultimately, what we'd say is just go for it. Do it. But yes. Be fully aware yes. of uh, all the pitfalls and the downsides to this lifestyle as well. Yes. Inform yourself and watch Five Reasons Not to Buy a Boat on our YouTube channel. And by the way, <laughs> by the way... Someone did say, well, you've told us about all the bad sides. What about the good sides? To which you replied back then, well, we did do another video and it was called Five Reasons to Buy a Sailboat. People don't watch it. They're not interested. They just want to hear the negative. Mm. But it's out there. Anyway, good luck to you all. Peace and fair winds. And, uh, well, I think the first we're going to do is to see if this actually came out, what with all the winds going on around us. I've no idea. Hopefully you have heard this, so thanks very much for listening. <laughs>